So today I'll be presenting the use of governmental ad administrative data in the public sector to improve the understanding of issues around child maltreatment. Unfortunately, um, this is maybe this may not going to be focusing strictly focusing on machine learning because um, machine learning in the public sector is still a very sensitive topic even if we are still doing the work. But today's topic is going to be like how we are using the administrative data collected by government government um, agencies and um, how the huge amount of data that has been collected and stored by government agencies but which are still kept in silos and spread among various authorities and how we are doing making effort to um, link those data to identify and answer those issues around child welfare system. So this project is this project used the California birth records and child protective services records to understand child to child maltreatment recidivism at a child a children le uh, sorry family level and examine how the changes of risk factors uh, found at birth among two births affect the family's um, child protective service system reinvolvement. So um, just to introduce the background of the issue, so of all the children victims, uh, maltreatment victims in the United States in 2017, one third of the one third of them had a prior history of a child protective service system engagement. So when I say CPS, it's gonna be child protective service system. So having CPS engagement, meaning that they were reported to the child welfare service system for any alleged maltreatment. So there has been but yet no best way to estimate recidivism as depending on time frame, types of child protective system involvement and the characteristics of a child and family. Um, family. So that's, that's why the estimating recidivism has been very difficult and um, there is still like no agreed way of def defining this recidivism. So this leads to widely varying recidivism rates from 20% to 81%. So some people say only 20% children are re-reported re to the system versus some other people say 80% of the ch children we report reported to the system, depending on the follow-up time frame, whether we are looking at two years or 10 years or types of CPS involvement, whether it's just a you know, um, simple refer referral or placed in the foster care system, or at the same time, the characteristics of the child and family. So these all different um, way, of, way of viewing creates delays in our understanding of a child of maltreatment or citizen, which possibly imp impedes our efforts to protect children from the negative uh, ramifications of child of maltreatment, repeating child maltreatment, such as you know, um, delaying in the developmental cognitive development or their you know, psychological or behavioral issues. So just to give you some brief about the data, child protective systems data, I will go through, I'll, I'll um, run you through the, you know, um, the hypothetical child pathway through the child protective services. So let's say this child was born and then um, had the first referral to the hotline call to the system as for the alleged maltreatment at age four and for the allegations like general neglect and physical abuse. And then, and then the, it turned out to be like, actually it's not substantial, that's substantiated with meaning like there's no substantiated maltreatment allegation was found. So child was a stayed home, but at age 10, the child was re-referred and then for another allegation like neglect again, and then this time it was substantiated and then the child was placed in the relative's home uh, by foster care system, but then child was re returned to the family at age 11 and then referred again at age 13. So all this information that it just stopped is they're, they're all collected and stored in the child protective services system records. And the, when I say CPS records, that these these records are what I'm saying, and and as you can see here, this is all child like single child focused data system. Meaning that if this child was referred at age ten, and then after the referral, if it, the the child's sibling was referred, it's gonna count it as like another first referral for the child, but without thinking about whether this family was reinvolved the system another time. So when I say like child child focus, child levels uh, data records, that this is what I'm what I'm saying. 
So current system, current child protective service records uh, focus on the single child to estimate recidivism following a single child over time to see whether the child is referred or substantiated, but it does not reflect other children at home exposed to the same risk factors. When you think about it, you know, uh, if the child, child, fam like the parents who were not capable of taking good care of this child, of course, the other child in the same family must have been exposed to the same risk factors. So it is mainly because so the reason why we only have like childhood sing single child focused data is mainly because the CPS records are at a child level. So if we take a family level approach to estimate child maltreatment recidivism allow us to um, take into consideration of other children at the same household. So it is important because most of the child maltreatment risk factors are relevant to caregivers and affect all children at the family level. So, um, so advances in data linkage enabled us to identify siblings born to the same mothers and allowed us to analyze CPS records at the family level, which I'm going to go through next slide. No, ne ne in the following slide, not, not in the next slide. So next slide, um, I'm, I'm presenting the aims of the study. So this study aimed to estimate the rate of family level child protective services system reinvolvement and examine the association between family level um, CPS reinvolvement risk and dynamic risk factors so this family level analysis of child maltreatment was done focusing on the mothers. Since it was not possible to identify children living in the same household given the data that we have. So um, so at different time point, we don't know which child is living in the same household. So we just followed the mothers and then identify those, those children born to the same mothers to see whether this mom was re re referred to the system for different child's um, child maltreatment, allegation allegate, of maltreatment. So we, so, um, so to do this, we follow the first time mothers and see whether they were reinvolved um, after the first child first referral. So to, to see this, like, so mom, mom gave the first birth and after this child was referred, see whether the mother gave another birth and then see the, uh, the maltreatment outcome for these another the additional child to and then and while we are following the risk factors involved with this first child and then following child and how the risk factors for the mom, mom's birth change how that will affect the following versus following child um, maltreatment outcome so this is just high level overview of the methods um, we did data, data cleaning and linkage using machine learning algorithm method and then we created the variables and then we did the an analysis. So I think this is um, what, you know, we can, you can most relate to because it shows like how we did the data linkage across two different, you know, multiple different um, data sources housed by different authorities, the government agency authorities. So to conduct family level analysis using um, child focused, which is child level um, CPS records, we linked the birth records from 1999 to 2016 based on the metronal unique and non-unique variables, such as mother's name, birth, birth dates, and social security number and address, meaning um, we put all the data together and then Select like kind of clustering, but we did the by like the dyes method. So we matched all the records versus the older records and we linked them together based on the mother's information to find all the dyes of children that who share the same mother information. And then we cleaned them to make sure that, um, you know, not the same children, you know, we don't have any duplicate children in the same under same moms. So we clean everything. So the data uh, basically looked like for the mother one her all the children that she gave the birth over the 18 years were belong to this mother id so we so this this way we identify all the families all the children born to the same mothers then for the uh, once we identify the children born to the same mothers over these almost 20 years we link the children's birth records to the child protective service records to obtain their child welfare service trajectories meaning for each child, 
we found these children's ch ch um, child, ch child protective service records in the other data set to see whether this each child was involved with a uh, CPS system. And then, and then we filtered all the mothers that we were interested in. So the, we, the mothers that we are interested in were those who gave the first time birth in 1999 and then had the first child reported to the CPS within the first years of um, the first child in life. And then following that re referral, give another birth. And then these, the younger child is going to be our focus of interest. So just to be more clear, so um, these four mothers gave one or two births, and then only the first two mothers were our uh, research of interest because these two mothers were those who gave the first birth and then first child had the referral and then gave another birth. And it was mainly because um, if the if we, if this mom gave two births and then the first child was referred, meaning that this second child was also going to be referred, you know, reported to the CPS. So looking at these child, um, this child, this child's multi-month outcome doesn't really add a lot of knowledge to us. So we wanted to just separate these two events. And so once the child protective service system involved, if the mother gave another new birth, whether the mother was still you know um in, in a vulnerable situation where the following birth the child was uh, you know reported to cps but if mother the mother gave two birth and then after the second birth and she was re reported to cps and then she didn't give any more birth after that she was not in our study so we just wanted to make sure that the first referral and the following birth were um, separated enough so that we can see whether changing of the risk factors actually can affect the following child maltreatment outcome. So these are the risk factors that we identified. And just to understand like how risk factors are associated with, associated with the child protective service outcomes. And so to code this, so and then we wanted to see whether the change of these risk factors between the first birth and the following birth how the, the change of the respect may affect the following child's uh, multi-month outcome. We identified these, these respect can be found in our birth records. So in the birth records, we can see the mother's maternal age at birth. So we made a binary um, respect variable, whether the, the birth was minor or non-minor. And we could also find the maternal education records, the education level to mom. So what's the maternal education level at the birth? So whether the mother at uh, graduate high school or not at the, at the point of birth was another uh, risk factor for us. So if the graduate high school at the birth, it's going to be no risk factor. But if she did not graduate high school at the birth, it's going to be a risk factor. And then prenatal care, you can start prenatal care any point of your birth term but if you start in the first trimester which mean which means the first three months of your birth it's it shows it's a you know it's a safe approach for your prenatal care so early initiation of the prenatal care within the first trimester showing no risk factor versus if a mom could not start their first trimester tri, uh, prenatal care during the first trimester we considered that as a kind of risk factor for the child like showing, kind of reflecting some kind of risk factor around this situation. So we put that as a uh, risk factor, positive, positive risk factor. And also if the, whether the mom or, pay the, mom or family paid the birth with the public insurance or not. So paying the birth with the public insurance in the United States means that they're uh, in the kind of lower side of income level. So that actually, that can be actually a proxy for the economical status for the family. So we put that as a risk factor as well. And whether the paternity established at birth, whether it, the birth records of the father's information was also one of the risk factors. So if the paternity was not established, we couldn't find any father information at birth, meaning it, it was an it was an indication for um, some kind of risk factor that you know mom had mom will be a single mother, right? And whether the birth, the child was born with a lower weight under twenty five hundred gram was also another risk factor. So we 
um, binarily coded all the risk factors we could find in the birth. Then, so those binarily um, coded risk factors can be found in two both births, right? So it's possible that the first child had all the risk factors, but the, the following child didn't have any risk factors. That mean, it means it can be an indication for the family that the family somehow the situation got better if the risk factor all disappeared. And then what's going to happen to this child maltreatment outcome was our uh, focus of interest. So for each risk factors, we we saw we we uh, coded the change of the fa risk factors whether it, it, it was a um, no risk found at both both birth or um, new risk factor kicked in for the following birth or there was a, a risk for the first birth but the risk factor disappeared for the following birth or the risk factor existed constantly from the first and following birth for each birth uh, each risk factor so we coded it in for the four levels to see the outcome of the uh, following birth. So, um, yeah, so this is what I just ex explained. So this check, check mark means that there was a risk. So for the six um, birth, the risk, the risk factors found at birth for each of them, they're all coded as a, uh, four levels from zero to three. And then there was that the case that there was no risk found at birth for, for both of the births was coded as a zero as a reference. So just to give you a heads up here, it, we, we used the linear regression model. So the outcome is gonna be whether or not this following younger child was reported to the CPS, which means the re-involvement for the, the, for the whole family following the first child, child referral as a zero or one Yes, coded as one and no, coded as zero, whether the following child was, you know, again, reported the, the system. And each risk factors were coded from zero to three, showing like compared to this reference level, how this risk factor change affected the risk of this following child report, report for the CPS. So from here, I'll just go, walk you through our findings uh, from the descriptive analysis. So all the first, so all the, in, in 1999 in California, um, 512,077 mothers gave, the, gave any birth. And then about 200,000 mothers gave the first time birth. So we filtered them out. And then again, we filtered those mothers who had their first child reported to CPS before age five. There are about 20 mothers, 20 in 20, uh, 21,000 mothers. And among these mothers who gave another birth, which is gonna be our child of focus, another birth after the first child first referral was 15,000 mothers. And those are the mothers that we put in the model. And our the first results for you know how many children like you know you just wonder how many children or how many mothers got re reported after their first child was reported to the CPS. About half of the mothers who were involved with CPS for their first child in uh, maltreatment, alleged maltreatment, were re reported to the CPS for their new child um, allegation. This is so. So it was after they got all the services for the first child. If they give another birth, half of them are likely to get re-reported for the maltreatment for their ch their children. So when I say maltreatment, I don't I, I'm not meaning like any kind of like intentional maltreatment. It can be like a neglect or just you know just circumstances are not just e easy enough, and then the mother was just not capable of taking good care of the children. So they are in a very difficult position to take good care of these children and then the government need to step in to take good care of this family mother and then children as well and when we look at the children born following the first child so so see this 1999 all the child first children child that we are the focus of our interests are born in here and the following children born across from 2000 like even like some of them still born in 1999 but from 2000 to 2016 over the almost like 17 years and and the, this blue line is the referral uh, referral rate so this 
so among all these children that born like late after the first child first referral, these children who were born right after the first child referral had the highest rate of referral, meaning about like fifty eight percent of them were uh, referred to the child maltreatment system. And when we look at the racial disparity, um, I want to look at this plaque. Uh, mothers are, so about 6% of the first time mothers are black in California. And about like 13% of them were referred for the first child and 15% of them, oh, almost 6% of them were referred for the following child's um, maltreatment where you know, uh, where the white moms or Hispanic families are quite consistent over the each level, like black mothers' families, you know, showing the increasing rate of uh, re-involvement over the, you know, over the steps of the engagement. So from here, uh, here I will present the results of the linear regression analysis, and the target variable is whether the mother was re-reported re for the another child referral following the first child referral. So whether this newborn child was referred to the, the system as these risk factors change over time. So for the minor birth risk factor, um, you can see that like, no risk. So, but, but compared to the Compared to the situation when mom gave the birth, both birth without being minor, meaning like older than age 20, compared this no risk case, um, if the mom was the minor mom for the first birth, or the mom gave the both both birth being minor, increased the risk of this following child referral about you know 1.2 uh, could uh, risk factors or like one about like 50 percent higher higher than those uh, refer reference case. And when it comes to public insurance, um, this this shows up a different different risk increasing pattern, but compared to this, compared to no risk case, when the mother paid the mother paid the, the following birth with public insurance when when the family could afford the private insurance for the first birth if the, they move down to move on to the public insurance for the following birth, that increased the risk almost twice. And and also compared to that, um, paying like public insurance for both births also like increased the risk almost more than twice. And maternal education also, so, um, also, sorry, so I did, I forgot to mention, but these stars asterisk, meaning like the p-values lower than a 0 0.001 if there are three stars. So it's very significantly increased the risk with, if the mother didn't have the high school education for both birth compared to those mothers who had the um, high school graduation, graduate diploma on in both birth. And this is, I think, we thought this would be interesting because this is the only point when there was a risk factor involved with both like any of the birth actually showed no significant difference compared to the mom who got to start their prenatal care in the first trimester. So those, compared to those moms who had no issue of um, starting their in the prenatal care during the first trimester, meaning no risk factor in both, both birth, those moms who could, could not start their um, prenatal care during the first trimester, but somehow, somehow they could manage to start their prenatal care in the following birth should almost no difference or actually even lower risk, but it's not significant, but like a towards like a no risk, uh, no higher risk or towards like a lower risk side uh, compared to this, this mother with no risk. So for, for the following, following child maltreatment um, outcome. So uh, we thought this is very interesting, but uh, um, I'm going to discuss this later in the discussion. But this doesn't mean anything like a causal relationship between prenatal care and the following child with maltreatment relationship, maltreatment outcome, because 
it, we don't want to say as if like, oh, having prenatal care actually decreased the risk of the uh, falling, birth, falling child multi outcome. It can be just, you know, any kind of situational improvement could have affected the way of that this family could take care of this child. So there is no simple causality. But anyways, this, this was an indication of the lower risk of uh, falling child maltreatment at risk. Um, so, and then paternity also, it was, it's also interesting because um, even moving from the risk to no risk, meaning that the first child didn't have any paternal information in, in the birth, but the following child had the risk factor risk factor show, no, sorry, following child had, 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 had a father figure in their birth records, but the risk of um, maltreatment, in get maltreatment outcome was still very quite significantly high, higher than those children who had the father's father figure in their birth records. And then we interpreted it as uh, maybe, you know, having, you know, if, if, if father information was not constant over, over time, it's really likely that maybe you know um, children children were living with the father who came into the family new, newly. Maybe like they their the mother was having like a different male partner, and that can be actually as some kind of um, you know tension or some kind. It can be some kind of indicator of um, you know family um, risk risk maybe. So. That was, this was a, also another interesting um, outcome of our analysis. And then lastly, this also shows that it's, I, uh, we thought we, this can be also linked to the prenatal care because meaning um, the mother could do, be good, could be you know, in a good, good situation where the baby could be born with a uh, you know, good birth weight. Could actually indicate indicate that you know the better situation the family was uh, raising the child, and it was it also showed like almost no difference compared to those children with no risk over the two births. So three things. Um, so firstly, one in two children born to mothers who gave a history of prior report were reported. And although still limited, this study were this study could show the possibility of a distinguishing future report of focal child by using birth records data, and also um, having access to early prenatal care is really important, and it is, it can be an indication that the mother is in a better place, and it is possible that the, the you know prenatal care has a causal relationship, but. You know, we want to be very careful to say like any causal relationship based on this like, regression model. But getting mothers into prenatal care can connect them to providers and services that has a protective effect when it comes to risk of their next born child. And but more likely, it is an indication that the mother is in a better place. So, access access and services is very important. We concluded, and most importantly. Linking administrative data that are spread in silos and machine learning data linkage, we can extend our knowledge base of child welfare services. And that was the end of my presentation, and thank you for listening.